Hello and welcome to the Believe Crew podcast. The business is you. I'm Jamie White, founder of Believe Crew and your host. Let's jump right in. Jamie, I know we share the same name in the beginning and we even spell it the same. Somehow our parents decided to name us with Jamie, which I love. But tell me more about how you got started. So I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've owned about six different businesses. A bunch of them have failed. Wow. I've had success too. So I took one, I've bought and sold businesses. I took one business from zero to a million in about 26 That's months. Awesome. But there's a lot, there's a lot of stories of that one that we could go over. And then now I own a business where I help activate mm-hmm. other solopreneurs and small business owners to really fall in love with their sales process. Wow. I used to hate sales. And so why not fall in love with something that can help build the income and the impact that you want in this world? And so I help people um, reframe how they look at sales and the nuts and bolts of the business um, build those in place so that you can do what you want to in this life. I love it. I love that you full on accept and admit that you've built some things that have failed because that was something that held me back for a long time. I held on to a business that probably could have and should have been shut down because I did not want to admit like if if the business was still there then in my mind it it wasn't admitting failure <laughs> it was like it still exists it just doesn't have a profit or anything it's fine it's, it's fine. fine everything's fine get a t-shirt it's fine that right. should be for entrepreneurs much in the midwest like there's no feelings fine. you're just fine <laughs> Yes. Right. And then my mom would tell yes. me, you're fine. And I'm like, after years of therapy, I'm like, actually, fine is not an emotion. <laughs> Found that out. But I look at failure as the word fail is first attempt in learning. I see life as a classroom. And yes, failure can be hard and difficult. And sometimes it is hard to get back up. And I've been in the pits of despair many times in my life. But I also know in the end is that I can do this. And the only thing that's in my way is myself. There's no one else. I love that. And so, and that's sometimes hard to admit because boy, is it fun to blame other people. Boy, is it fun, right? To be like, well, it's my vendor's fault or it's my customer's fault. Well, they're not buying things because they don't understand the value of my Mm. product. It's harder to say, I don't know how to explain the value of my product. I don't know how to sell myself. It's a very different place. It's a very humbling place. And um, one of my businesses where I was a photographer, I was a very talented photographer I did covers of magazines and calendars and all things like that, but um, I didn't sell myself. Mm. And so it eventually joined it down. I just didn't want to. I thought I was amazing and everyone would know it and people will just naturally come to me. No, it's slow, but over time. um, And if you want to grow quickly, that's not the way to grow quickly. So explain that a little bit more because I hear what you're saying and I feel like there's so much more there. When you say it's not a way to grow quickly. So you're saying we could slowly collect clients, kind of not really master our messaging, not really know what we're supposed to be doing or saying, but we'll get there slowly. But what have you seen the the capacity or what have you seen business owners be able to do that they really didn't think was possible by implementing some of the things that you're saying? That's a great question. So a lot of times clients, when they come to me, um, and I've been in this place in business too, where I just got referrals. Right. You get referrals. They're hot leads. There's hot, warm, and cold leads. Right. Cold calls, like cold calling. You've never met them in your life. A hot lead is someone, you refer someone to me and they know, like, and trust you. So it's that halo effect that they know, like, and trust me. And it's an easy, it's like a conversation. They've already been sold. Yep. Right. So that's a very, that's almost no sales process. Right. Right. So what happens is if you don't take care of your referral partners um, and you just keep moving along or you're not uh, delivering what you had promised or there's lots of things that can happen and that dries up like your referral garden dries up and you can't pick carrots anymore than carrots Mm. or peas or corn growing because you haven't cultivated it. What happens then is that you need to move to how can I have a broader reach of people and then now they're warm and cold leads you need a proven sales process to walk them through because they need to know, like, and trust you. And that takes more of a formula, a method so that you can convert higher and close more business. So that's what I help. They usually come to me at that point because people can spend years organically growing. And if you want to grow real slowly like this, just do the referrals thing. If your referral garden doesn't grow up, dry up, up. you know, dry up. Right. 
so, but usually people are like, I'm, or I'm stuck. They yeah. get stuck somewhere yeah. or they're just barely growing. And that's when I'm like, I'm ready. I'm ready to grow. And that's usually um, when they come to me and they want to start going in that direction. This is super awesome. So when you're working with clients, would you say all of your work is direct one-on-one work or do you do group type stuff or what are you finding right now is, is the best? Yeah. One-on-one. I do one-on-one work. Um, We also have groups. So we have an eight week accelerator in a group where it's the energy of the group. And every week they're putting how many people they've reached out to, how much business they've closed. Right. Creating that consistency and accountability with you kind of leading the discussions and helping them think differently. But otherwise that one-on-one work where you're like digging in with clients is sort of the primary, or would you say it's a mix of both? Um, it's a mix and that's, okay. um, in terms of looking, it's a premium to do one-on-one, right? right. Then you get right. everything answered for you. But in the group, I feel like group is more helpful because you're being encouraged mm-hmm. by not just me, you're learning from, you right. know, a variety of other people in different industries. And so mm-hmm. you're getting that richer group environment. I see that's really important. Group's not always a good fit for everyone, but I think people yeah. are surprised once they get in, they're like, oh, this is actually really amazing. Because I can't see Jamie all the time, but I can call so and so, and then you build these really rich, deep connections with other business yeah. owners. Because it can be lonely. I'm sure you've been yeah. there too. Where, yeah, I mean, there's moments where you're like, I feel like I'm the only person going through this. <laughs> yes, I just came back from a retreat where his slogan is um, something like "Building a business can be hard or is hard. Uh, don't grow it alone." And it was one of those retreats and conferences where when you walk up to a group, the circle widens. And I just want to continue to be a part of that because what you're saying is true. And what I love is the vulnerability of business owners. Like what you said, when you first started is I've failed in some of my businesses, knowing that that's a higher level of consciousness, that there's a higher, higher level of people that you're connecting with on a regular basis to be able to admit that right from the get go. (laughs) Like that's the type of group that I want to be involved in. Right. Right. I want to work with people who are ready to be vulnerable, Mm -hmm, who are ready to be humble. If I'm in a sales call with you and you start blaming other people for what has happened or, you know, there's a, or the victim mentality and things like that, like, sorry, that little red wagon doesn't work anymore. You need to drop the wagon and, and, and stand up and be a grown ass adult and move forward. And if you need therapy, go to therapy. So I can get my whole soapbox. (laughs) A lot of people who work with me, I highly suggest they do therapy at the same time. (laughs) Because guess what? <laughs> Just tell them straight up. I agree. I agree. I have a holistic well, therapist or a life coach that I'm like, and you're going to want some time with her too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. And I, you know, Becky Clayball works with me and she mm-hmm. is an ace at emotional regulation. Yeah. And so in that eight week accelerator, not only are you getting nuts and bolts of the sales process, building that out, our close with confidence um, signature method. And then uh, I teach the content and then she comes in secondary on Thursdays. And she's like, okay, probably everyone's nervous system's on fire with what Jamie has you working on your pretty accountability system, you know, your, um, all your sitting pretty documents that we have. So I'm here to just do hot seat work. Where are you being triggered? And let's bring our nervous system down so we can get the work done. Because if your nervous system's on fire, you can't focus. You're a monkey, right? Your cortisol's running through your system. So it's really important to have that mindset and that emotional regulation. And that's forgotten in a lot of sales programs. And I'll yeah. admit forever, I didn't do mindset. I just said, deal with it. We need to yeah. do the sales process, like deal with it. And then now I'm realizing how important it is over the past few years to bring someone in to help manage the mindset because that's that's the biggest piece. It speeds up the process. Yeah. Because otherwise <laughs> we can we can learn how to do the work, but then why aren't we doing it? A lot of times people are like, you need an accountability partner. It's not an account- accountability problem. It's because there's something about it that is uncomfortable for me. And I haven't worked through that yet. <laughs> like, what is it? So like what you're saying is it has the same impact as an accountability person, but yet it's more. I'm it's more sense. effective. I think having an yeah. accountability partner is a piece to the puzzle. But yeah. the, if you're thinking about big rocks and little rocks, the big rock is a mindset piece and the big rock right. is limiting beliefs. Right. I remember, uh, I mean, I, in my distribution business is, um, I remember one of my limiting beliefs is you have to work really, really, really hard to make money. Yeah. Really, really hard. Or it's, or yeah. you shouldn't be making any money. Yeah. I would work seven days a week. I, yeah. if a client or if a pet store, like I serviced, um, thousands of pet stores across the U S 
Um, mm-hmm. I had a team of 20 plus sales reps. Um, and I remember if they called me on Sunday at seven o'clock and they needed something and I could run it over to them that night, I would do it. You would do it. Wow. I would do anything so much to the point that at one point I, um, I was like, I couldn't wake up in the morning. I was exhausted constantly. I couldn't mm-hmm. digest food. Um, I then tested, <laughs> this is such a nerd I am. So I'm like, I know I'm sick, but I don't know what's wrong. So I actually ordered an HTMA test. Are you familiar with the HTMA? Mm-hmm. Hair tissue mineral analysis. Oh, yeah. So I cut a piece of my hair, shipped it to a lab in Dallas, and it came back that I had basically uh, almost adrenal fatigue. Um, right. Adrenal fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. So I went to my doctor and I gave this report. So I'm like, I think I have adrenal fatigue and I know I have issues with my thyroid. And she's like, I don't know how to, <laughs> I don't know about this, but they did test me. I had adrenal fatigue stage two. So when I- yeah. Sat by a window. I actually wore, wore sunglasses 100 percent of the time. My eyes wouldn't oh, dilate yes. properly. Yeah. I don't know if if you've experienced mm-hmm. adrenal fatigue. I have actually. Have. <laughs> yeah, we talked about this. That's right. I know what this is about. Yeah. Yeah, it's so much. It's that exhaustion. You can't sleep off. You cannot sleep it off. I mean, yeah. it took. I had to get rid of. I remember my doctor's like, "You should get rid of alcohol and caffeine out of your diet." And I'm like, "So can I do one or the other?" <laughs> Well, that didn't help for me because I've never had, I mean, I don't, not that I haven't had caffeine, but I don't typically drink caffeine or alcohol. So that wouldn't have helped. That wouldn't have solved my problem. So did it work for you? (laughs) I got rid of coffee and it helped for me. I was drinking five matcha latte things from Starbucks. Like they knew me at Starbucks a block away from my warehouse. Right, right. Just to keep my eyes open every day. So when you were working this crazy hard and and creating this much impact or, or doing all these things in your body, really... Did you heal and stop working as hard while you were still there? Or did you end up having to leave that? I left. Mm. I left. So I decided this is so incredibly toxic. I remember, I remember being in my warehouse and just everyone was gone and I was trying to pack orders and I couldn't read the orders because when I got really, I even dyslexia started to pop up. I get that when I'm really stressed and I physically couldn't read the numbers of what to put in the box. And it was late at night. And I remember just sliding down the back on just sliding down in the middle of an aisle and crying. Like I can't even read this effing piece of paper. What am I doing with my life? Like what, why am I doing this? And I had this big realization and, um, I did have to leave and take some time off. Yeah. And it was great. It was terrible. It was great. It was probably one of the worst times of my life, the most saddest time I've ever had. Cause I just, uh, in constant panic attacks, like not being able to breathe mm. and waking up in the middle of the night, like nonsense. Right. Mm. And it was, uh, I was based on a variety of limiting beliefs. Let's be real here. But that was the biggest one is you have to work really, really hard or you're not really helping people in yeah. order to make money. So that was just, um, that was a great moment of burnout and failure that I'll never forget. And for, to this day, I am very on top of taking care of myself, what I eat, how much I sleep, um, who I spend time with. That was another right. thing. Right. And also getting a lot of extra therapy help and having supportive mm-hmm. people around me at all times. My red velvet rope, so to speak, whoever, what I can't remember the author's name, Michael Port this is for sales is who gets to work with you. Who are your ideal clients? Mm-hmm. Who are you letting behind your red velvet mm-hmm. robe? Rope, excuse me, not your robe. That's weird. Yeah. Who you <laughs> Hello. Um, the sinus infection brain fog, but um, your red velvet rope, who gets to work with you? Who gets to spend time with you? Um, and I think that applies also for your personal life as an mm-hmm. entrepreneur is um, who influence you, influences you in your life, who encourages you and supports you. Who's there for you? That matters. A big deal. Wow, this stuff is huge stuff, and I've I've um, been learning it over the years recently. Like about eight years ago is when I was done with my adrenal, and I had I was definitely the words that I said the most often where I'm frustrated, and I technically was blaming other people all the time. I started by recognizing I needed to take care of myself in some way. It was just the beginning though. The stuff that I've learned in the last four years about the limiting belief stuff has moved me through farther and faster and boundaries and 
you know, changing who my circle is and being true to my word, you know, and just having integrity to myself. So I'm hearing a lot of what you're saying and realizing that it's part of the process. Yeah, it's part of the process. And I like what you said, you know, um, is not only giving yourself permission, but also Mm. the commitments you make to yourself. Yeah. I think a lot of times, you know, I teach intuition and sales again, not always told, you know, shared in sales training and we can strengthen our intuition by building trust with ourselves. And we build trust by ourselves, by the commitments we make and we follow through with. If I make a commitment that I'm going to meditate every morning and I don't do that, I'm breaking a commitment to myself, which breaks the trust with myself, which also inhibits my ability to tap in my intuition. So we make commitments in our eight week accelerator. What are your commitments that you're making to Mm. yourself? Right. We need to build, maybe we need to build back trust into who we are so that we come more in alignment who, who we are. And it's that heart over that hustle. Where's our alignment with our heart in this process? And who are we? That also helps you figure out who your ideal clients are. It just, it's almost like, um, yeah, I think of, I just think of my chiropractor. Sorry. Um, she, aligns my atlas bone, which is at the top of the the backbone. And it just realigns the whole backbone instead of doing every little piece. And I feel like that piece and building trust with yourself, using your intuition and sales is that piece. And then everything just falls into place. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's totally true. And I love that visual. So when you were at burnout and um, walked away and did some work, then you ended up going back. I did not go back to that environment. Oh, no, okay. not to that warehouse. No. Yeah. Um, what I decided to do is take some time off. So I took some time off yeah. and then I actually went and worked at an international coaching business and no it way. was such a great experience. I still am friends with people there and it was wonderful. And I, I mean, it was not easy work. I mean, it was wonderful work, but I learned so much in the process and it was my way to kind of heal and come back and to help activate other yeah. I learned how much I enjoyed the impact I had with motivated, um, mission driven, um, entrepreneurs and activating them to go do great things. Cause also too, I could very much connect with them on failure. Mm -hmm. Any good entrepreneur has fallen down time and time again. The difference about a successful entrepreneur is they've gotten themselves back up and they'll do it again and again. Right. And so that's fun to work with those people because a lot of them had hit a point where like I had hit bankruptcy or I had done, you know, a terrible fail or I lost my biggest client and they come with these stories and I'm like, I hear you, let's work Mm -hmm. through this, Um, you know, have the empathy for what has happened and to honor it and celebrate it, forgive ourselves. Right. Which is a really right. big, really, really huge thing. Huge piece. <laughs> Usually yeah. when I'm working through forgiveness, it's like, I need to forgive them. Oh, wait, I need to forgive myself for not forgiving them. <laughs> like there's two levels to every forgiveness. No, for oh sure. I, I remember I was so mad at a vendor that I had and, um, and rightly so. And also I, I had some part in it too, but boy, was I wanted to blame them for years yeah. and years. And so I had to write, I can't tell you how many letters I wrote, starting with being really angry, but I didn't send any letters. Let's be very clear. I love it. I'm, I love I'm it. a pyro. So I write it and I then I burn it. I love it. Writing letters to them, how much I hated them and what they had done. Those were most of the letters where you're like taking your pen and stabbing yeah. the paper and being like, you know what I mean? Burning those and then going through the process of forgiving them and saying mm-hmm. how much I appreciated what this did for mm-hmm. me. And then going, moving to uh, be mad at myself for being mad at them and then going through my (laughs) process to forgive me. It's like a four part process to go through. And it was hard work. That's really cool. I haven't tried anything like that. I write my prayers out in detail, thanking the Lord as though it's already been taken care of. And so that has really helped me learn to release things faster. Oh, like, I love that. Oh, that it's already yes. been done. So it's, it's like, already been done. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Ooh, that's yeah. It's a thinking. new practice and it's created miracles for me. Like just being able to let go of things faster and then actually things work out in a different way that I couldn't have planned, that I couldn't have picked. So I'm like, thank you. <laughs> thank you for taking care of that. 
Oh, I love that because you're writing out the what. What do I want? I think that's really important to hone in and focus what you want. What are those desires? And not worry about the how. Exactly. I used to just beg, you know, like, please. Please. (laughs) It wasn't as effective, I can tell you. It was not. It didn't shift my energy because I was still in a place of hopelessness, helplessness, you know, resentment, unforgiveness, because I was just, I was begging in prayer. And I get it, you know, like, that that's maybe part of the process. But now if I can shift that energy to a place of thankfulness and like, thank you for taking care of that. And yeah. moving on. Yeah. And it's a out of lack and into gratitude. Yes. Because yeah, it's for sure. actually been proven that you're the brain, the gray matter in your brain, the chemistry changes when you become in a state of gratitude. Mm. That's what's been I mean, happening. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what you did. I mean, you did exactly what science says works. And I mean, I've had clients too, where they come to me and they're like, I just bombed these three deals, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And let's just stop for a minute. We're being triggered. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Let's just sit where we're at. And um, let's list of all the things that you've done great this year. Right. Yeah. Let's celebrate all those things and be grateful. And what are you grateful right now? Enlist those things. It's a great thing to do to bump up your vibrational level. And it's scientifically proven, which I love. That is so awesome. So I'm interested. You go to work for this coaching organization, changes your perspective. So at what point are you starting to go? Where where do you start to see that conflict where you feel like you need to work hard, but you're realizing it's not working? Like, did you just, you know, flip this? flip the switch it was just a light switch moment. And you just went from working super hard burnout to no longer. What was um, the- I think I was forced to mm-hmm. because my body, I then was so, and I knew when I started to feel like I was going to have a panic attack, I knew mm-hmm. all the signs right. and I would just be like, I can't work any longer tonight. It's not worth it. No. I just feel like it's yeah. not worth it. I can do it tomorrow morning. Let me get a good night's sleep and I can wake up early in the morning if I need to. Yeah. Or I had the D I call it the DEA comes in. How can I delegate this? Can I eliminate it or can I automate it? And Mm, I became a master at those three things because my health, I was more important because I remember those moments where I couldn't get out of bed. The moments when I remember driving in my car and I was dozing off and I'm drinking much. I couldn't even keep my eyes open. Like I remember those moments of so much just horrible. I felt I was I was miserable. I won't use bad words on this, but I want to right now. I was <laughs> effing miserable. If anyone's ever been there, you remember those moments. Yeah. And I hold them in my heart as a gift that I'd never want to be that way. Nothing is worth it. Mm-hmm. And then I also, in my business, I always say, listen, what's the urgency here? Why am I mm-hmm. rushing? Why am I putting pressure on myself? I don't deliver kidneys to emergency rooms for emergency right. surgery. No one's going to die if I don't get this done. Right. They're going to wait and they can wait. And I gave myself a whole new permission to take care of myself. And that changed everything. It sounds like you've done a lot of work. And I have a question that might be a little vulnerable. Did you find that any of these came from the way that you were raised in childhood? What do you mean? Like the beliefs beliefs about I need to work hard? All of them. All of them. I mean, I can't think of one that didn't come from childhood in some form. And you know what? Our parents do the best they can. Absolutely. I need my six sons to forgive me on a regular basis. <laughs> right. For a long time, I blamed them. And through a lot of therapy, self-work, retreats, all those things that are so hard, those realizations, when it comes down to at the end of the day, the buck stops here. Yeah. I'm responsible for my life. I'm responsible for my business. And it's how I respond to things. And they tried their best. Um, and so it is what it is and it's my turn to yeah. change and stop this process. So my kids don't have these limiting beliefs yeah. too. Yeah. There's a couple of books that came to mind while you were saying that when I think about the journey that I went on was the QBQ and I can't remember who wrote that one, uh, the question behind the question and then extreme ownership. Is that Jocko Willenick, something like that? Um, extreme. Yeah. I'm, I've read yeah. it. It was a while ago, but that's a great book. Well, and I read it partially to my kids cause you know, I'm a great skimmer and I usually like to read the first three chapters and recommend it to someone else. Um, but <laughs> full same, disclosure. Same, same. <laughs> so, but if I read it to somebody else, then I, then I'm held a little bit more to the fullness of the book. So I, I may have skimmed it still, but it was a lot more. And I just remember reading one of the stories where he talks about, um, 
well, just the level of intensity in the mistake that was being made and the mistake that was made in the book. And um, they were basically almost firing on their own team or something like that. I forget the details, but when he goes back to the, whoever's above him in um, the army, it's like, well, whose fault is this? And he took ownership, right? And so that was that extreme ownership moment. And I was, I was realizing that there were things that I hadn't been taking ownership of in what I was leading and what I was doing. And I wanted to blame other people and other things. And it's like, you know what, what if, what if I could take extreme ownership for this, what would change? And I really believe that that was one of the pivotal moments for me. I think if we all took ownership, extreme ownership in our life and our business, the world would be a very different place. Mm. Oh, that one of the things you had said earlier too was, uh, reminded me of when employees that would want to hire me, that would want me to hire them would come in and they would complain about their previous boss. Red flag. I was like, yeah, You're the out. first thing I would say to them is, um, you probably aren't going to like me either <laughs> because it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But that actually reminds me of the other thing I was thinking about is I'm working on this idea that there's, there's a shift going on in society right now between let's say bosses or leaders and how employees want to come in and work. And so this thinking that our parents had that they trained us on that, you know, our value and our worth is in what we do and what we can get done and working hard versus our value is in who we are and who we're being. I feel like that's a societal shift even like not just that it was a parent thing versus a a kid thing, because there's a problem happening where a lot of companies and bosses are wanting people to show up the way that they expect them to show up. And I believe that the businesses need to change and the leaders in the businesses need to change to embrace what the incoming generation, do you see that? Or do you think that the generation that's incoming needs to change? Like, am I the only one seeing this? I think there, there could be a middle road in some in mm. fashion. And Maybe I'm word, just not good at would win, win, win such win, situations. Win. <laughs> no, like, the came up for me as you're explaining that and it's invisible contract. Mm. How many invisible contracts do we have with people in our lives, with our employees, with mm. our bosses on how things should be and expectations for them? I think the more that we can talk about it, the more we're transparent about our expectations on both sides of the house is going to improve the situation because if employees are coming in with expectations for something very different from the employer, no one talks about it and they have invisible contracts that no one signed, it's going to be a mess. But if we start sharing what we need, then the demand for that, well, then um, the supply is going to have to show up. And so those companies that don't adapt are going to die. They just won't have employees. That's what that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, I mean, look at how many restaurants I've been to since after COVID or fast food where they're like, yeah. listen, we close at this time. We don't have enough. Yeah. Because that whole industry is shifting in a big way and boy, is it slow to adapt. Yes, that's what it is. It's slow to adapt. I like that wording instead of that the employees are the problems. Well, right. It's, a, it's the industry to stay the way it was. It's changing. <laughs> yeah, just like anything. Yeah. Just like anything. Yeah. Every generation brings a different flavor yeah. and, and richness yeah. to our history. Yes. And yeah. so this is an opportunity for us to adapt. And and again, if you don't, then you no longer are going to yeah. be here. Mm. Yeah. So I love that. If if there's things that you're working with clients on or even for yourself, what are some of the things that you would really love to have people know about? being a business owner or about selling or what are some of the things that you would love to share with people? Selling Mm -hmm. is about serving. It should always be hard over hustle. Lean into your impact. Hmm. A lot of people forget how important, how you're changing the world. And if we lean into how we're helping and changing others and serving them, it's not sales. It's, it's and really that more feminine you know? side, embracing that more feminine side is what I'm hearing. Like it's okay yeah. to be. Yeah. And it's okay to align your sales process and not do, listen, traditional right. sales processes right. were made for men. Sorry. I right. love men. Right. I do. Um, but it's an old school way of selling. It's a, 
as my friend Kate Bailey said, she used this analogy the other day in my podcast, is that it's a sandbox that was not built for women. Okay. It's a sandbox not built for women. So we, I am starting the movement of building a sandbox that works for women, a sales process that's aligned with our gifts, that we're speaking from our heart, that we're serving others um, and not being this sales cringeworthy, icky, gross, slimy thing yeah. that no longer works anyway right? Things have changed. People are slow to adapt. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me. I will on occasion go through sales process with other companies just to see what it's like. Yeah. And the amount of pressure sales is ridiculous depending on what industry you're in, but they still old school it. And so there's a different way to do sales and we can do a way that mm. feels good. So even when you close right. them to it also feels good. Sometimes there can be remorse like, oh, I closed them, but I feel guilty. Oh, so I'm going to throw in all these free extra things. Oh, and in the last minute, I'll give them a discount, right? And then, so what makes us feel better, but Nessus and doesn't, it's just mm -hmm. kind of putting Band-Aid on a huge gash, right? So if we reframe how we look at sales and really lean into our impact and how we can help others, I think we really can't go wrong. Wow, I love that. And I can see so many opportunities in it. Is there anything else when you think of all of the business experience that you had from the beginning? What are the other things when you think about business overall, some of the things that come up for you? That's so interesting you asked this question. This has been coming up so much for me, and I was just got back from a trip from Hawaii, and it just kind of landed on my face one day walking on the beach, is that business can be a vehicle for you to heal. Ooh, I really like that. I have not heard that before. Yeah. So healing through business, I look at mm. all the businesses I've had and I would have not had so many opportunities to heal if I was not an entrepreneur. Wow. Because it rips the bandaid off of everything. Like wow. you have to learn all the things. So you're healing and growing in a way that you wouldn't have had that opportunity potentially. You could, right. but it's a great opportunity if you of healing, how can we heal through business? And that branched off all so many fun ideas. Things things are going to be coming down the pipe with that because that's really resonating with some people. I'm talking about some other leaders. You're, so. you're saying, you're speaking truth. And I did not word it that way. I would not have thought about it that way. I've, I've heard it from the John Maxwell perspective of like lifting the lid on your capacity or like as a leader, you know, you are the limit and then everybody under you can only go as high as you are. And I know that leaders need to grow and develop personally and that we can only grow our companies as much as our personal growth. You know, like we, we just, our capacity is maxing out based on where we are personally. But I love the perspective that you're coming from, which is similar and the same stuff, but just in a new way. And it really speaks to the work that I've been doing since launching my own company, because before I've been the implementer um, in family businesses. And I've learned so much over the years in and through business and about myself through business and having to deal with things. And I just love the way that you're wording that. This is the perspective that I'm taking it right now, is that when I'm running into something new, I have an opportunity to heal something in myself so that I can move beyond whatever it was that was holding me back. And oftentimes I feel like it feels like a wall or a barrier in front of us, but it's actually more of like an invisible barrier. And I think when you said invisible contracts, I kind of spoke to that too, but it's, it's actually more like ropes from the past holding and pulling me back when it feels like something that is in front of me. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I love how you word that too. Yeah. It's holding ropes, holding back, but in essence, you're holding the ropes. True. Absolutely. Almost like you're doing yes. this, holding yeah. the ropes and all you have to do is just yeah. drop them. Mm. Sounds that right. easy, right. right? It's not. I love it. It can be, but yes. it can be though. Yeah. It's being willing to acknowledge it because I had some that I was working through today and um, my coach, Kara, who works with us in Believe Crew is sometimes also my coach. She's our holistic coach in the team. And she'll, you know, she'll ask me like, what like what meaning does it have? Or, you know, what meaning am I giving it? Or um, why is it serving me to keep them? And sometimes it's so painful to acknowledge. And so what was coming up was there was a belief system that I needed to change. The belief system was not serving me, even though it was in some weird ways. But then behind that was actually a heart wall 
And I could feel the pain almost in my heart as we were talking about it. And it was that someone had said something a year ago that someone that I really respected and it, it made it so that my belief was in conflict, right? Because I didn't want that what this person, I, I, I didn't want to think differently of this person. If I accepted it as not true, then all of a sudden, maybe some of the other things that I thought about them weren't true either. So I was like, I'm not sure I'm ready to acknowledge that. <laughs> but, but technically, it only took minutes to work through it. But it's still big stuff, stuff that I've been holding on to for a year that's been holding me back. Yeah, of the cognitive dissonance, right? You have a belief, but it doesn't match up with what's actually happening. And so you're like, ah, what should I do? But also all those limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. think about that. They're unconscious right. at times. So working with a coach right. or a therapist, bringing it conscious so that you can then release it. That's a process. Because if not, you're coming into a room. It's like right. having an invisible bag of garbage on your back. And every piece yeah. of garbage is a limiting belief. And every time you remove one, you're, I mean, people can feel it. Yes. I can feel 100%. when I meet with someone, a heaviness 100%. of someone who has all mm -hmm. these loads of limiting beliefs and it's so heavy. Um, people can feel it in the room. Um, I even had a coach I worked with years ago. I met up with her last year at the fall and she goes, Jamie, I, I mean, we loved working together. And she said, that you're just, you're so much lighter. That's awesome. Yeah. Best and compliment. so feeling in that presence, that's what we all want. We all want to feel lighter in so many different ways. So yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I have really enjoyed our conversation together. And is there anything else that has not been said or that you feel like needs to be said? Otherwise, maybe this is just uh, one of many conversations. <laughs> Yeah, I enjoyed this so much. I forgot we were on a podcast. So <laughs> I love this so much. I think we align in so many different ways. Yeah. And I think there's, I mean, if anyone would like to learn more yes. about our programs that impact the income, I'm sure you'll have that in the show notes. Our Sitting Pretty community, that's free. Anyone can join in. Um, and our our eight-week accelerator, it's called Light It Up Accelerator, um, in addition to one-on-one -on -one coaching. So there's it. lots of opportunities to move forward in your business. I love it. And I love that you've given that offer out. So we will absolutely share the links and thank you for this.